Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to lecture guide number six, The Arts of Ancient Rome. Um, this is another fairly long lecture, not as long as the Greek lecture from last week, but fairly long. It's a very uh, obviously complicated culture with a lot of artistic output. And of course we know a lot about it because just like the Greeks, we uh, have access to their language and can and have a, a very kind of solid history of what was going on in ancient Greece. However, with that being said, I am going to skip past the um, what is in your text as the Etruscan history part uh, and only focus on a few of the key examples of Roman arts. Um, rather than trying to cover everything. There's a lot of really good, very imp interesting information in your text about other areas. Uh, and so I thought I'd pick out some key examples and go into greater depth on those. So with that being said, um, you know, in front of you on the screen, of course, you have my talking head once again, which you can minimize and just look at the lecture if you want, just the, the presentation part. Um, let me give you a little history of of ancient Greece, or I'm sorry, ancient Rome, uh, starting with some of their mythology about how they came into being. There are two standard stories about this. Um, again, they're probably part true and part fictitious. Obviously, the part where these figures, as you will see, are descendants from gods is likely not true. So first, um, basic history the area that is now italy of course is where the roman empire had its center in rome of course and this area um, uh, was settled by the greeks as early as the mid 8th century bce somewhere around 750 or so bce the greeks really start to uh, colonize parts of italy in the area that's now known as tuscany in particular um, but they're all over the place and this will help to explain, at least in part, why so much of Roman art is indebted to Greek forms and Greek ideas, although they make it their own. Um, one of the things to keep in mind all the way through is that unlike the Greeks, the or rather unlike most of the history of Greece, the Romans were a very militaristic society. It was an essential part of their, uh, even during Republican times, um, but it's it's certainly a part of their um, drive for empire and that shows up in a lot of their different art forms not only in the way that they depict figures very individualistically uh, based upon their individual exploits uh, and the importance of a, a particular member of society but also in the fact that uh, if you were to want to attain anything in roman life you absolutely had to be a part of the military. It was compulsory, except for the aristocratic class, the really famous families, but all of them as well were a part of the military uh, in order to, to gain some kind of status. As a matter of fact, it was compulsory to be in the military to hold any political office, which was your access to power in ancient Rome. So that's something to keep in mind. Number two, Roman culture is very syncretic. Um, that's a term that we use in history and in art to designate a society who, in this case, may take over other cultures or take, you know, expand itself colonially, but is more than happy to allow the traditions of the society that has been taken over to continue to exist, including their religions. And although in some instances, you know, this isn't entirely true. In other words, the Romans at various times, you know, you probably heard, have a big problem with the rise of Christianity for a while. Um, it's very partial. Like there's only a few emperors who really have a problem with Christianity and the others just let it go on its own. As a matter of fact, the Roman religion um, isn't something that we're gonna designate here because much of it is Greek. Much of it is ancient kind of Etruscan ideas that get filtered into Roman culture. And, you know, in the time period that we're covering, there's no really official religion of Rome right up until the time. And, and even here with Constantine, when he starts to adopt Christianity, it's not an official adoption of Christianity. There's no official religion. So there might be at any one time, you know, 40, 50 religions going on 
at once. Although they all do hold by the Greek gods and they all do hold by the sun god, uh, who is seen as a, a kind of um, manifestation of Apollo and very much aligned with the Roman emperor himself, once we get to um, imperial times anyway. So back to their myths of origin. One of the stories, of course, is that uh, Rome is founded by the famous brothers Romulus and Remus. Romulus and Remus were understood to be um, the sons of Mars, the god of war, who in, of course, Greek times is Ares, the god of war. The, the Romans, as I made mention of, adopt all of the Greek gods into their pantheon of gods and mix them up with other gods as well. Now, in this story, Romulus and Remus um, come to the area that is now Rome, find it populated by probably the Etruscans, but also a neighboring tribe known as the Sabines. Um, Romulus himself is immortal. He has been born of Mars. And so, you know, it's like the Greek heroes. He's, he's half human, half God. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they find themselves in Rome. Some stories have it that they were, you know, came to Rome as children and were suckled by a she-wolf, um, you know, a, a wolf that you see in the textbook. I'm not going to go into that very controversial work here. It seems like it's not a Roman work at all these days. But in any case, the mythology has it that these these two children who are born of the god Mars find themselves in the area that's now known as Italy in Rome as children um, without parents and are suckled um, by a she-wolf, which is probably a metaphor for the idea that they're very hard. You know, they're they're actually literally raised by wolves, and so they'll go on to do great warriorly things. Probably mythology, right? But maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe there was a Romulus. Maybe there was a Remus. The other story is, and by the way, to carry that story forward a little bit, because some of this comes in your text, and, and I don't know how much of it I'll talk, talk about here today. Um, at a particular moment in time, after these two have grown up, uh, Rome or the beginnings of the Roman Empire don't have enough women, and so they invite their neighbors, the Sabines, over for a banquet and steal all their wives and their, their daughters so as to propagate the Roman Empire. Uh, gives you a little sense of what the Romans are like in some way. Winner-take-all kind of philosophy. The other big mythology or story is that Rome are, Romans are all descendants of the great, again, demigod Aeneas, who escaped from Troy. Uh, Aeneas is understood as the son of, of Venus, uh, an immortal man, and he starts Rome. And again, the Sabine story ends up in this one as well. Early on, uh, all the way up until the first century BCE, Rome is a republic, which means that it is a, a kind of pseudo-democracy. As a matter of fact, the United States founded its own democracy based upon the two houses uh, that were established in Republican Rome for our Congress and our Senate. Um, in Rome, there were a group of elected magistrates, usually from the upper echelons of society, headed by two consuls. These consuls were elected by the magistrates and by the Senate, who then uh, ruled over uh, the Roman Empire or the Roman Republic at this point. That uh, Those two consuls and the magistrates were advised by a Senate and an advisory council made up of what were known as uh, plebeians and patricians. The plebeians are the lower class people, and I don't mean low class like, you know, they don't have any money, but not in the upper echelons, whereas the patricians are all members of very kind of um, established families in Rome. Uh, around, uh, somewhere around um, 390 BCE, the Gauls who you met when we were looking at Greek culture, sack Rome, but it doesn't seem to have had a, a ton of effect. And by 275, the Romans pretty much control all of Italy, having absorbed the Etruscan culture into their own culture, uh, including all of the Greek colonies that existed on, uh, on Italy have been absorbed into Roman culture. They start the Punic Wars around this same time, um, which are the wars against Carthage and North Africa, area 
today, probably uh, Algeria. They, they kind of continue to win these major battles. They have a very, very established military, a very, very kind of rigorous training for that and aspirations to control all of the areas that might help them to grow. Around uh, 130 to 133 BCE, the Republic is in a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of civil wars, um, a lot of uh, leaders trying to buy for power. And this lasts all the way up until the time of the famous reign of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar rose to power through the military as just about every single one of these emperors that you'll hear about does. He was controlling the area now known as France, the Gallic uh, area. Uh, he amassed a huge army, very faithful army. And when he came back into Rome, Amidst all of this turmoil, he basically politically maneuvered, maneuvered to gain himself power for a very brief moment and is proclaimed Caesar. In, in 46 BCE, he is basically the dictator of the Roman Empire. Again, before this time, which we're not going to cover a lot of, uh, Rome is uh, an erstwhile democratic republic, and then it becomes an empire. In 44 BCE, only a couple of years after he's been declared um, the Caesar, the leader, uh, Julius Caesar is, of course, assassinated by members of the Senate who band together um, to take him out uh, because he's, he's unconquerable otherwise. And there's a, a jockeying for power, and eventually Augustus Octavian uh, takes power and assassinates or goes into battle against Brutus and Cassius, these two major members of the Senate who were also leaders in the Republic, who um, were part of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Eventually, of course, Octavian Augustus, he becomes, becomes known as Caesar Augustus, has those famous battles against Mark Antony and Cleopatra to finally um, consolidate all of his power. And he is proclaimed the first emperor of Rome. So to back up a little bit here, then talk about Brutus. Um, you know, there are a number of Brutuses in this story, but one of the early Republican uh, leaders, Brutus, you see here, and this is an example of Roman portrait sculpture. Um, Roman portrait sculpture of the Republican period, more often than not, is what we call veristic. It's meant to be a likeness of the person that it represents. Unlike Greek culture that idealized its subject, uh, Roman culture tended to want to focus on the individual characteristics of uh, the person that was sitting for the portrait. There are a couple of reasons for this. One of them is right off the bat that these types of portrait sculptures um, probably related to the cult of ancestors that the Romans will continue to practice all the way through the period that we're covering. And this cult of ancestors is a belief that the heritage of one leads to, um, leads to the, the promise of the individual. Or another way to put it is, is if your grandfather was a great person and your father was a great person, in all likelihood, you'll be a great person. And the visual resemblance of you to these early ancestors is something that uh, acknowledges that. But they believe this even further. They believe that basically the spirits, or I mean, they wouldn't call it spirits, but the, the power of the ancestors resided still in this world and could be called upon by the living. And those, those types of sculptures could be called upon if they're accurate likenesses uh, by someone who's living. Another major reason for this, though, is that these are very political portraits. These are meant to be set up in different parts of Rome or through the, the, the Roman Republic in order to um, stand in for the person who may or may not be there. In other words, if Brutus wasn't there, but a sculpture was, and he had an emissary who was in town where that sculpture was, you would approach the sculpture and ask Brutus for something or demand a judgment on some legality. And the emissary who was standing next to the sculpture would um, you know, make a decision either for or against you based upon the authority that was understood to be vested in the actual image of Brutus 
himself in this case. So you see this, this sculpture in front of you. It is, um, you know, a beautiful, beautiful, uh, very accurate representation, one believes, of this, um, of this great leader of the Republic. It's made out of Sir Perdu process uh, bronze again with inlaid eyes. And I think you can tell just by looking at it that this looks like an individual person. That's certainly the case as well. Um, as we look at a couple of other, um, oh, look what's up here of the inlaid eyes. Look at a couple of other marble uh, portraits of patricians. These are, again, the upper echelon of society, people who held political office, um, who came from very prominent families, and the, you know, the same functions of these hold true. Now, in both cases, you can tell that these are individual people, right? They don't look like idealized types. They don't look like stylized or generic faces. They look very particular to the person. And it's curious too, because this is one of the first instances where we have this great degree of what we wanna call here realism, if it is indeed realism. Um, we can even tell in both of these that they have been uh, probably members of uh, the military in the scarring on the face that was oftentimes a mark of pride among the, the Roman people to have served your country, to have taken, uh, you know, um, battle wounds. This was a, a mark of your commitment to the Roman society. If we compare, for instance, the Roman patrician on the right to a sculpture, um, a sculptural de uh, depiction of Alexander the Great on the left, who, by the way, the Romans adored, um, you see the difference between these two. Alexander's portrait, even though it is, we know from coinage uh, and the repetition of various characteristics of Alexander based upon what he looks like, in particular, the calic that you see here in the front of his hair. Apparently, Alexander the Great had this, this big calic, and it shows up in all of the coinage of him and most of the sculptures of him. You can also tell that it's been abstracted or idealized, turned into a more generic form versus the Roman patrician. Or just a couple of others, right? Now you can tell, too, that these are men of a particular age, a little bit older on, and that's because it took Roman uh, men quite a deal of time to attain status in Roman society. They had to work their way through the military, they had to work their way up the political ranks, and by the time they had amassed power and wealth enough to create sculptures of themselves, they were oftentimes, you know, fairly old. And so you see the wrinkles on the faces of these two uh, portraits. This is one that's in the book to designate this one function of these. It's another patrician sculpture, a full length one. Um, curiously enough, uh, as you will have read the book, it's you see those heads that he's holding. These are his ancestors, and this is him showing his hereditary line and where he comes from and prominent people in his background and why he is a man to be taken seriously. But it also alerts us to something about the way that these sculptures were made. That body is a generic body. You could go into any kind of sculptures workshop and pick out what, you know, out of a, a group of 10, 15 different bodies, whatever body you wanted. And then that sculptor would sculpt a portrait bust ahead of you to put on that sculpture uh, and affix it, affix it to that sculpture so as to give it a likeness to you. Here, what this man is claiming is his power in relation to his ancestors. Again, these types of busts would have also been held in the household of Romans and basically worshipped. Um, one would draw power from one's relation to these past figures or ask them for advice or help and so forth. So they do have a quality of, you know, what we saw very early on, animism or fetishism in the idea that a inanimate sculpture holds some kind of power by its linkage to the past. But here that linkage to the past comes through its accuracy, its the fact that it looks like these earlier figures. Moving closer to the time of um, Imperial Rome, and on if you if you haven't watched it before, you know Netflix has that series Rome. It's got all these characters in it. If you want to go run and see that, it's a kind of entertainment form of this story. 
But on the left here is Pompey the Great, one of the great senators who was a, you know, he was a consul of Rome for a while as well. So a very powerful leader uh, who built, you know, uh, really interesting architecture. And then on the right is Julius Caesar, the man who uh, takes over uh, Rome briefly, but establishes the precedent for uh, Rome as an empire with one emperor, one leader. And you can tell if you're ever wondering why we uh, you know, call that kind of haircut, the Caesar haircut, it's because all of his portraits, including his coinage, have that haircut, the Caesar haircut. And you can see kind of Pompey's likeness as well. First major sculpture of this lecture comes uh, during the time of the reign of Octavian Augustus. Octavian is a relative of Julius Caesar, who attains the, the uh, power after the fall of Julius Caesar and consolidates that, as, as I said early on, by taking out the two other characters, a, a later Brutus and Cassius, um, in order, and then later on Mark Antony, in order to claim himself to be emperor. He's a very long-lived emperor, and he rules over a period in, uh, in Rome that sees a incredible expansion of its borders, a great deal of prosperity. And so there's a ton of things that were created during his time that are basically um, commemorating uh, his, his reign. And this is probably the most famous standing sculpture of him. It's called the Augustus Prima Porta. Uh, it was a sculpture that was found on the, the lands of his wife, Livia, who you'll see a portrait of in a bit. And, and it is very typical of these early um, imperial Roman sculptures. It may look familiar to you, and there's a reason for that. Um, it is based upon a perfect canon of proportions taken from Polyclitus's Doriferos from ancient Greece. And so your first kind of acknowledgement here is that the Romans love the Greeks and the Romans love the idea of perfect ratios and idealism. But they also want that to be accompanied by a individual's likeness. And so unlike the Doriferos who just had that far off stoic look on his face and looked like a generic type, the face of Augustus here, Caesar Augustus, is a likeness to him. As a matter of fact, though, there are certain components of this that are, we, we have to pause here and say it's not entirely a likeness. He's clearly wanting to draw a correlation between himself and Alexander the Great, who he aspires to be, another great emperor, right? So in his hair here, you see a little indication of a cowlick, and if you uh, look at that facial type of Alexander again, you'll notice that it's fairly similar to him. The differences between the sculpture, of course, and the Doriferos are many, however. It is based upon a perfect canon of proportions, but it is totally typically Roman. This gesture where he reaches out like this towards us is meant to signify that he is speaking. And of course, many of you know, and you will have read about this, Romans gained and held their power based upon the eloquence of their speeches. They often um, spoke to crowds of Romans in order to convince them of their ideas and to get them on their side. And so think of him at a rostrum, which is the, the kind of speaking podium that the Romans use, speaking to a, a crowd of people. That's what we're supposed to understand here versus Doriferos just holding that spear. Secondly, um, the Augustus Prima Porta obviously is clothed in armor. The idea of perfection, of course, or, you know, the Doriferos uh, and making that figure nude so as to show it works really well as an abstract idea. It doesn't work so well if your leader is standing in front of you completely naked. Um, the other reason, though, here is that, of course, he wants to show himself as a great military leader, and so he wears armor here. And that armor, by the way, is filled with symbols all the way around. What he holds in his other hand is not a spear. Over here, this, this pole that is here uh, is what is known as the facies. You don't need to remember that. But it's a symbol of power. It comes from Republican Rome and continues into Imperial Rome, where it becomes a scepter, a symbol of his, um, his right to lead people. Then we get up here again a little bit 
sir, you'll see on his armor, which isn't really accurate armor at all, is it? It's kind of like a nude body. Um, you can see his, you know, belly button. You can see his nipples here, and then over the top of it has all of this sculptural stuff. Now, that sculptural stuff that's on here is pretty complicated, so I'm going to kind of simplify it for us. Um, in the fourth century BCE, the Romans had lost a battle to the Parthenians, and the Parthenians had captured all of their um, all of their um, um, flags, all of their banners, all of their um, all of the things that were symbolic that were taken into battle in front of them, their standards. Um, in a in an overwhelming defeat of the Roman Empire, uh, Roman Republic. They had held these as a sign of pride up until the time of Caesar Augustus, who treated them, and he did this because he had overwhelming power to wipe them out if they refused, to give those standards back. So what you're witnessing here right in the center of this whole thing is symbolic of, or rather it's a kind of narrative in which Augustus here is receiving back from the Parthenians over on this side all of these battle standards, and it's a it's a, then a, a symbol on the sculpture of his diplomatic um, victory. He didn't even have to shed blood in order to win these things back, right? The, um, the other thing, though, that's going on here is that if you look up above, we see celestial gods here. It's not clear who they are um, up above. So gods of the sky and down below gods of the earth, both who look over the rule of Augustus. Now these may be, and it probably is, uh, Apollo and his sun chariot. This could be Zeus up here, or he would have been known as Jupiter by the Romans. Uh, and down here, um, a goddess uh, who is known as Tellus Mater, or Mother Earth. Um, but the, the point of this is all to say that he is protected by the gods. Now, eventually, Caesar Augustus will be named a god. He, it's called a, the process is called apotheosis. They turn him into a god. Uh, but at this moment, he doesn't want to claim that for political reasons. So he's probably just indicating that that's a possibility. I want to come back here for a moment. It's on the Doriferos. And by the way, this, as you'll recall, is a Roman copy of a Greek original. It has this strut down below it to hold it up, this kind of tree stump or whatever it is, and a strut between the, the arm uh, and the leg here. This one also has a strut here, but that strut has been sculpted into a dolphin, uh, and on top of the dolphin is Cupid, who is riding him. Now, in this case, uh, if you remember that Aeneas was the son of uh, Venus, that's what this is in reference to. Uh, again, the early Greek god Aphrodite is known by the Romans as Venus. Aeneas, who is a founder of Rome, comes from the Greek god Venus. And so what we're saying here is that Octavian, or Caesar Augustus now, comes from this long line of important men that started with Aeneas and find their roots in the gods and in Greek culture. And all of that political propaganda is, uh, you know, found in this one sculpture. Now you need to know how did this thing function? You know, what did this do? And there were probably many, many copies of this all over the Roman Empire. Um, and this would have been symbolic, again, a commemorative of all the achievements of Caesar Augustus. But the other way it functioned was, as I said, with those earlier plebeian, uh, I'm sorry, patrician sculptures as a kind of adjudicator. Um, these would be set up in different outposts throughout the empire, and the person who was the administrator of those outposts gained his power by being in uh, proximity to these, by being able to, when someone had a problem, bring them before the, the sculpture of Caesar Augustus here. Uh, and making a determination based upon the idea that this conferred onto that advisor the power of Caesar Augustus. I just want to show you these very briefly. Um, Caesar Augustus's wife was named Livia. Uh, women in Roman culture hold, held uh, very important positions as advisors, but never political office. 
Um, they oftentimes, though, had uh, independence that we don't see in Greek culture or any other culture before this, except for, you know, moments of Egyptian culture where Hatshepsut, for, for instance, attains a position of power. Um, and, and so you see that here. The other thing that's curious about Roman sculptures of women, of course, is that fashion was very important to both men and women, but more so to women. And you see a, a picture of Livia on the left, um, looking very kind of uh, simple, um, an, a very simple, very austere look to her. Uh, and then on the right, you see a hairstyle there uh, of a moment in time where um, that austerity has gone away and what is uh, desired of women is uh, great flamboyance and the hair becomes a, a key um, part of that style. I mean, look at it from the back as well. It's just an incredibly elaborate style, associating her with a particular class of women and uh, as being, you know, in in the time. Most important sculptures from Caesar, Caesar Augustus's reign is the so-called Ara Pacis or Arch of Peace of uh, Caesar Augustus Auguste. What you're seeing is it here in its contemporary setting, it's been taken out of the weather and placed in its own, and by the way, this has been updated since this slide, its own um, setting. It used to be out on the um, on this very special uh, plaza or opening the Field of Mars uh, that had a lot of other monuments there as well. And the, the Romans, of course, love to um, dedicate monuments to their leaders, um, both in order to kind of propagate ideas about their power, but also to commemorate their great achievements. And this does both. It was commissioned during his life in order to commemorate his, his age of peace. He brought a lot of peace and prosperity to the Roman Empire. It was open to the sky so that the light of the sun god, the major god that the, the Roman emperors aligned themselves, could shine right down on the interior. And it's totally covered with relief sculpture. And that relief sculpture has a bunch of different symbolic forms, so we'll go through some of the big ones. You can see on this entrance um, some floral designs on the bottom and then some figural groupings on the top. And the front, you see, for instance, one of the founding myths of Rome, uh, Romulus and Remus, and it's, it's a, in a deteriorated state, but you see the reconstructive drawing over on the right. Romulus and Remus suckling at the um, at the teats of the she wolf while these gods look on. Or on that same panel, you see the other myth: sacrifice of Aeneas um, to dedicate new Rome uh, for the empire. So you know, it's kind of hedging his bets a little bit. It could be Romulus and Remus, could be Aeneas. I come from both in any case, so they're both depicted here. One of the most uh, important panels uh, is the other side. So if we get up here close, this is a symbol again of Roma. Roma is over on the right hand side here. So if you look here, it's been completely destroyed. And we only have this tiny little part, but based upon dedication inscriptions and um, visual testimony about this, we know what used to be here. So this is symbolic of Rome. So we get up here close on Rome. You see that this is a figure, it's a, probably a, meant to be a female figure. Um, usually personifications are female figures. She's warrior-like. She may be associated with uh, Athena or the Romans would call her Minerva. She holds a sword in one hand. She sits on shields. You see the she-wolf down here on one of those shields. Uh, and then over here, she has that, that scepter or symbol of power. Now notice as well, since this is an arch of peace, uh, this figure has taken off all of its armor. That's symbolic of kind of peace times. We move over to the other side of this. We get a really complex scene here that's been partially reconstructed. Um, this is a scene uh, that shows you um, some, some pretty important figures in uh, Roman culture. In the um, in the center, you see um, a figure probably here of Tellus Mater. Tellus Mater, or Mother Earth, is a symbol of fertility and fecundity. She's kind of the latest manifestation of this old 
Venus figures that we saw from uh, you know prehistoric times and we've seen multiple times before. The idea of uh, fertility and fecundity is not just childbirth. Of course, it's the idea of a future of you know health and prosperity and so forth. And so sitting on her lap are two kind of chubby children eating various fruits that you know are right in her lap to symbolize um, sexual reproduction. Behind there is lots of foliage symbolizing prosperity of crops growing and so forth. We see down below her symbols of the prosperity of agriculture, a sheep and a, a bull here. And then on each side of this, probably mythological figures, although we're not entirely sure what they are. This one may be um, you know, a figure of Leda from Leda and the Swan, not entirely sure. And on the other side, another kind of goddess figure. Now, when we have these types of figures that aren't meant to represent anyone, you'll notice they are very idealized. They look like those Greek sculptures that we saw before. And, um, you know, this is um, this is kind of par for the course. If it's meant to be a representation of a figure, it will have a likeness of his face, but an idealized body. But if it's meant to be a god or a goddess or a personification of an idea, the Romans will idealize their forms. By the way, this is their um, personification or representation of water down here with a ship coming out. And this is a ship's head over here. You get some clips of this high relief marble sculpture here. You can see how those figures are in both high and low relief sticking out from the wall itself. And these two maybe uh, goddess figures, maybe those two figures sitting in her lap are supposed to be uh, Romulus and Remus. Um, but again, we're not entirely sure. On the north and south sides, on the upper register, we get representations of the royal family. I'm not going to belabor this, but you can probably tell that the faces in the ones that aren't totally destroyed, you see Augustus there, um, you know, majorly uh, destroyed. But you can see in the, the bodies that they're all of a type. They're all exactly the same height. They all look exactly the same. It's an idealization of the body, but not of the faces. And over here, you see some other key figures. I'm not going to tell you every single one of them, but they all we know who most of them are. This is Marcus Agrippa. Um, we see in this upper register over here and a close-up of him over here with his nose smashed off in this case, just a, uh, you know, through the passing of time, he was a great leader. More important leaders of this time, but now we start adding another element to this. One of the political doctrines of Caesar Augustus was basically family values to kind of simplify the whole thing. He pushed the idea of the importance of the Roman family. Um, and so all across the upper registers of these uh, of this monument, you see basically patrician families um, with their children of various ages all together. So as to designate the importance of this this policy in Rome under Caesar Augustus, that he was the man who really promoted family and family values. Very, you know, they're very kind of lifelike and, and very familial. Uh, so what you're looking at in front of you now is the Arch of Titus. Um, the Arch of uh, Titus is one of the kind of oldest Roman arches that is still extant. Um, Roman arches were erected to commemorate the, the great achievements of various leaders, usually dedications by, um, by the government of Rome. Even though there's an emperor, there's still a Senate and a house that advises um, this great leader. And so you see at the top of this, for instance, you can probably read it, it's in Latin, but you can read that it comes from the Senate uh, to commemorate uh, the, you know, Senatus here, uh, to commemorate the great achievements of Titus. Now we know that these arches go all the way back to ancient uh, Republican times, but this is the only one that's extant, um, you know, from, uh, from later on. Now, why are they created? Um, they are created 
usually on thresholds, on ways into the city or ways into the fora or ways, very important kind of entryways into Rome so that when people would pass through these, they would see these. They're not part of larger architectural settings. It's like they've just taken the idea of the triumph of an arch uh, and, and made a huge monument out of it. In the area that for Greeks, you know, up here in the entablature, you would put sculpture. The Romans put um, dedicatory uh, verbiage in Latin. They tell you who this is for. And then all the sculpture is on the faces of these and even on the inside of these. So um, Titus is most famous for conquering uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Titus conquers Jerusalem in about 70 uh, CE, 70 in the Common Era. So we're in the Common Era now. Um, the second bull uh, was conquered then. This is a reconstructive engraving of what this looked like during the 18th century. Um, these buildings off to the side were not part of the original building itself. This is what it looks like now, kind of left out on its own. But again, you would enter into the city through this. On the exterior, you have uh, a composite capital is both Ionic and Corinthian up here, showing its interest in ancient Greek times. When we get inside of this, there's the dedicatory monument. If you were to look up at the ceiling of the arch, there are these little rosettes. They're symbols, uh, again, of Rome, basically. They're primarily just meant to be symbols of an everlasting life and, and kind of decorative. But right in the middle is a, uh, a scene of the apotheosis of Titus. Titus, after his death, being designated as a god or becoming a god. Now, they, they took this idea from Greek culture. When the heroes died, oftentimes they were uh, apotheosized. They turned into gods, and the Romans start to adopt them themselves. When we look at the walls, the major sculpture which would have been in old times about head level if you're riding on a horse. So think of riding through this and looking to the side and seeing these relief sculptures shows his battle conquest. So here we have you know, horses drawing a chariot. Many of the heads have been lost, have been knocked off. Many of those, by the way, by Christians, um, you know, leading a uh, retinue back triumphantly into the city. It's not him in battle. It's him returning to the city with all of his spoils of war to, you know, the jubilation of the Roman uh, populace. Famously in this um, scene, which, by the way, when they sacked the te Second Temple of Jerusalem, you know, had a ton of really important religious objects for Judaic culture, they took the menorah from the temple, and you see that represented here. They probably also took the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark that held the original Ten Commandments, supposedly, of Moses, uh, although where that would be in the scene has been lost to us through time. But I will read you a little um, description of this uh, from, from, you know, uh, back in, uh, back not long from when this was created. The most interest, interesting of all the spoils seized from the Temple of Jerusalem, a gold table weighing many talents, a lampstand also made of gold, which was made in a form different from that which we usually employ. There was a central shaft fastened to the base, then spandrels and branches extending from this in an arrangement which rather resembled the shape of a triumph. Tri Trident. What he's talking about there is the menorah. He just doesn't know anything about Judaic culture. And on the end of each of these spandrels, a lamp was forged. There were seven of these, emphasizing the honor according to the number seven among the Jews. The law of the Jews, or the Ark of the Covenant, was borne along these uh, as the last of the spoils. Vespasian drove along beside it. Vespasian was, uh, you know, the next emperor along the line of Titus, and Titus followed him. Domitian rode beside them dressed in dazzling fashion and riding a horse, which was worth seeing. So if you're wondering um, where the Ark of uh, the Covenant ended up, um, you know, in addition to Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, here's another story, you know, ended up in Rome, at least for a bit around the age of Titus. The major architecture created by each one of the leaders uh, were known as forums or fora for plural. And these, again, are most 
um, easily kind of understood through your readings. Um, if you can think about the way that these are uh, cited in relation to other forums and so forth, it makes a lot more sense. But I'll just take you through the basics of these. If you follow my cursor here, most forums have a huge open area in the middle. This is an area where uh, where people can meet, where various public uh, speeches can be held and uh, you know people can amass to listen to those. Along the side of each side is a, a colonnade, a long row of columns that creates an under um, a sheltered area that you could have shops in here, you could have people meeting in here. It's kind of multi-use space. The main space is what's known as a basilica. And the basilica is a long space created through post and lentil systems with a big open area in the middle that can be used for any number of things. Um, eventually, this basilica, which in this case has two round ends on each side, will be turned into the Christian church. They'll just adapt the basilica form for the Christian church. In this form of Trajan, which you're looking at here, you have a big column, the column of Trajan, uh, that leads us into the sanctuary or the temple of Trajan uh, in the back where all the religious ceremonies were held. If you look at this from the top, you'll just see all this again. Um, you know, uh, a library in here, the basilica in the middle, a big open space, colonnades on both sides, and the temple in the background. Big thing that we're going to spend a lot of time on, or a bit anyway, is Trajan's column here. A reconstructive drawing of what it might have looked like with all of these beautiful sculptures around an equestrian monument. We'll see one of these coming up, a man on, on a horse and what all that means. Figures, uh, you know, leading chariots up here above. Um, they're basically big uh, architectural uh, settings that are kind of the center of that emperor's reign and uh, meant to monumentalize that leader's reign, make him seem very important. Um, it's not so dissimilar, I suppose, although these are always created during the reign of the leader as like a president having his presidential library uh, after he's done being president in the United States. The basilica is a really important form. You see that it's all held up by columns, two different tiers with open areas at the top to allow light in, but it allows a big space to be spanned here across the top, which leads me to another point. The Romans, of course, are famous for creating the Roman arch. You don't see that employed here much. You could find it in other areas of this forum. Um, but the other thing that they add to architecture and to building techniques is concrete. They begin to construct using, um, you know, very, very advanced forms of concrete that can be created in various molds that is incredibly strong and, of course, quick uh, to work with. So you can build big spaces very quickly. And then to decorate it, because let's face it, concrete's pretty, um, you know, ugly. They would face the concrete with more uh, beautiful forms like bronze plaques or copper, or their favorite, of course, were different types of stone, including marble. Column of Trajan is a, a kind of extraordinary column. It's a continuous band of relief sculpture that is primarily um, dedicated to Trajan's exploits in his Dacian campaigns. The Dacian campaigns were basically against contemporary German people uh, across the Danube River, and he expanded the uh, emperor's territory by taking over these areas. And then he has this continuous band, and, and by the way, these are individual pieces of marble that have all been affixed to the surface. Um, he has this continuous band of a narrative starting with kind of the organization of the troops and the crossing of the Danube all the way to his defeat of, uh, you know, the, the Dacians in various campaigns to his triumphant return to uh, the city itself. It's, it's huge. Let me grab my notes here really quick. The column of Trajan is um, 125 feet high. Uh, has uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 different figures on it, if not more. Uh, so you see what a, a, an incredible monument this is to his reign. This is what it looks like today. The Forum of Trajan was largely destroyed in later times. 
that we're going to post on this at the base is a symbol of his, uh, there's a lot of symbols of death down here. It's a scene that is meant to be commemorative of his funeral. There are different stories about whether his ashes were actually held in the base of this column. Some people believe they were, some people believe that that was just symbolic. But in any case, in many of these kind of columns that were erected by various emperors, ashes would be placed in the base. The, the Romans, by the way, practiced cremation. And in a kind of form of ritual um, commemoration, as well as a reinvigoration of the power of this great leader, um, Romans would perform what was known as the decursio, which was a walking around the column, uh, usually chanting, commemorating, and activating the spirit of the ancestor in a, uh, in a let's see, I think it's a counterclockwise uh, um, movement. If we start to move up the column now, the, the, and I can't obviously can't deal with all of this in our lecture, but we see some pretty cool um, sculptural renderings of the um, of the Romans here defeating the Dacians. I'm going to get a close up of this in a minute. So, for instance, here right at the base, you see. Roman soldier, soldiers crossing the Danube River, this is right at the beginning of the campaign, using a pontoon bridge. These are those bridges that were created out of logs that would float, all roped together, by the way, that could float. You just need a few people on one side and a few people on the other to tie it off, and huge amounts of Romans could get across a river very quickly to surprise their enemies without having to go to the areas where there was a bridge or there was a ford or something of that sort. You see that the Romans, by the way, are all very regimented. They look the same. The faces are a little bit different between them, but they do look the same because they are meant to be, you know, a marching army, marching very, very, um, you know, disciplined army. And you'll see that all the way through this, this sculpture. When we see the Dacians, they're not so regimented. They're kind of willy-nilly. The Danube River itself is personified by this figure, now, it's not clear that the Romans really believed that every river had its own spirit, but let's say they hedged their bets. Uh, they would oftentimes pay tribute to the spirits of rivers and the spirits of forest on their way into a battle in order to placate any spirits or gods that might have been there. You know, they, they don't like to take chances whether they believed it or not. And up above in these battles that you start to see, the Dacians, who are a little bit different, are all wearing different uh, helmets, and of course they are um, wearing different clothing. Or here you see the Romans going off into battle again, and that's pretty much the entire scene. Very regimented, coming against people that are kind of willy-nilly. Just uh, again, I, I'll just kind of leave this up here for a minute so you can look at it uh, to see just how extraordinary all this sculpting is all the way around it. It's led a lot of scholars to wonder how you could have ever seen this from all angles. You know, you could have walked up in the forum and seen parts of it, but it would have been really hard to see every single component. So it's it's more just a kind of marvel that people would look up at and say, wow. You know, I, what's going on out there, I can't really see, but look at all the exploits of this great leader, Trajan. Let me skip this. Well, you know, one of the favorite monuments of Romans, besides the Roman arch, besides the, the forum, which were working uh, architecture, were these monuments called equestrian monuments. They're, they should be very familiar to most of you. I bet everyone's seen one of these somewhere before. If you go to the East Coast, of course, they're all over the place commemorating uh, great leaders of, in particular, the Civil War. Um, but they start back here with Roman times. And so what you're looking at here is the equestrian monument uh, or statue of Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius, of course, another great leader of Rome uh, who... Uh, sitting astride his horse, and he's reaching out to people as if to address them, as if he's talking to them. The The symbolism of an equestrian monument will remain the same from Roman times to the present. The horse is like the state of Rome, all the people of Rome, and the armies of Rome. And 
the horseman, in this case, Marcus Aurelius, who's riding it, leads his people, leads his army, leads the state of Rome with the same kind of comp, uh, confidence and skill that he leads his horse. Notice here, you know, on one hand, he would have been holding reins that have since been lost, but he's really not doing much work you know, to stay on his horse, and that horse is going exactly, we presume, where he wants it to. They're always set up above us. This is a standard way to make them seem powerful, to set them up on high podium over above us here. This is the actual um, sculpture itself. This is cast out of bronze in the Serre Perdu process. But, by the way, they would make these out of multiple different pieces and then basically solder them together because it's too hard to do all at once. And it's quite a feat not only of engineering to do this, but also kind of the technique in order to keep it upright without it falling over, collapsing under its own weight. I'm going to pause here for a minute. That's the end of one. And when we come back, we'll start looking at some other architectural monuments, starting with the Pantheon in Rome. Don't get this mixed up with the Parthenon in Greece. It's easy to do. Be back with part two in a moment.